Good morning. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Jacqueline. Good morning, everyone. Love to see so many early birds in here. Happy May. Let me go ahead and close that window. so many folks good dodd i'm gonna be real with you when i logged on i saw so many people and i saw two guys on this call i'm like oh shoot did i open up the wrong link <laughs> hey i'm just i'm just glad i'm invited when that's the case oh we're so glad you're here yes twig is for everyone so really yeah. really happy to see you in here sounds great I, I don't blame you at all zoom rooms or you just never know where you're gonna land so wise woman just i just needed to triple check because it's, it's a little early for me but all right love seeing we have some people coming in hi brooke christina lindy anna rebecca jacqueline victoria ashley everybody feel free to put your cameras on if you want um, program's not going to start until 8 a.m. So this is some great time to meet other people, find some new friends, new work contacts, connect with other Twiggies, have some fun. Um, later today, or later this morning, we will have breakout rooms. So you get to meet people one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, Jennifer, good morning. Glad to see you here. Hannah, hi. Casey, thanks for turning on your camera. Hello, hello. 
week. So we've got a great program for you this morning. We're super excited to hear Laura Zapata's talk, um, as well as different announcements from Twig. We have a lot of events coming up, lots of different ways to, to connect, get plugged in, find your new favorite book, find your new bestie. Uh, and of course, word from our sponsors, our incredible sponsors who are going to be giving an infomercial for us today. Let's see. That Laura. Hi, Laura. Good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. All right. So I see people it's early in the morning. You got your favorite coffees. You got your teas. Who wants to show off their mugs? I know this crew has some really fun mugs in here. I want to see them. We'll spotlight them for the crew. Oh, Dodd, we are going to spotlight. We have to, we have to hear the story. <laughs> what that, you have a mug with wheels. How did you get that? Oh, my, I, I had a reputation for being a little bit of a hard worker a few years ago. And my, my staff bought that for me to remind me to slow down rather than to speed up. So. <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's good. All right. Who else had a mug? I saw people holding some up. Let's see. I want to say Jennifer had one. I'm just going for it. What you got there, Jennifer? Yes. I do not have a mug at all, but I have a hydro flask. If you are in the uh, water bottle, like interested in, you know, or a water bottle aficionado, if you will, I highly recommend hydro flask very durable, keeps the beverage very hot or very cold. And this, I have this huge, like, I guess, 32 ounce, however big this is, but it reminds me I got to drink more water. So it's like my hydration reminder. We all need that any time of day. Yeah. You know what would go great with that? Twig sticker. We got to slap a big old one of those on there. You're right. It would coordinate so well. I should totally do that. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see, Julie, I see you got a mug. Let's see what you got. Tell us the story behind that. Got some gnomes. I, I guess I had a reputation for a while for having a gnome obsession without realizing it. And so my sister saw this and thought it was appropriate to join my gnome <laughs> collection. <laughs> I love it. Gnomes are real people. Don't forget. Lindy, I saw you had one. Got a mug with a story. Hi. Um I know this artist, her name is Brooke, um, and I love this mug. It just feels so good in my hands. Nothing better than a homemade or homemade handmade mug, right? And I just have to chime in and say that Lindy is also an incredible ceramicist who makes her own things as well. So I thought it was gonna be your mug, Lindy. <laughs> it's mine. <my. laughs> I love it. I've been watching a lot of the great pottery throwdown. So it's so fun. Isn't it? Wanting to learn how to make my own mug. Anybody else got mugs or pets want to show off? I know everybody always has a dog not too far away. Renee, our wonderful board president. Tell us about your mug. It looks like it's got lots of good stuff. Very plain, but it's full of a lot of uh, English breakfast tea, which is wonderful at this time of day. It's just what you want at seven in the morning. Amazing. All right, so we got some more folks coming in. So happy to see you. Hey Zoe, glad you're here. Elaine, good to see you. Renna, hi Stephanie. Hey Elaine, how are you doing today? I am call. great. It's Friday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is a sunny Friday. What more could you ask for? And we have lots of Twig board members on the call, actually. 
So Twig board members, if you wouldn't mind renaming yourself, so it could be your name and then also board member, just so people can identify you and they have questions, they want to get more involved, they know to reach out um, with a private chat or a DM or all that kind of good stuff there. So you can see how many wonderful people are here to help you get more involved. So Twig has lots of opportunities besides our monthly programs, which the monthly programs are amazing and where we bring everybody together to learn from different women from across the state about their journey in sustainability and uh, what they're doing now and their efforts for the future and their future vision for Tennessee. But we have lots of other things. So we have a book club, Iris's book club, where we will meet, we'll discuss um, a different book around women and sustainability, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, all sorts of stuff. We're open for nominations too, if you've got your next amazing read that you want everyone to know about. We'll have a book club and then we'll get together and volunteer based off of the themes from that book. We will have, um, like I said, different volunteer opportunities um, to help out nonprofits that are doing great work in sustainability or maybe to expose the next generation to sustainability and the, the wonderfulness with everything that is green. And we have our Twig Seed Fund. So this is actually a scholarship fund for uh, any woman in, in sustainability in Tennessee, any age, any uh, kind of pursuit. So it doesn't have to just be to go to tuition. It can go to uh, maybe a workshop um, to help with sustainability or, or some kind of program or project. We take all sorts of applications. We have lots of money. We want to give it away. So please tell everyone about the Twig Seed Fund. And that's all on our website. All right. So it is 741 and you know what that means? It is time for breakout rooms. So you get to meet the more Twig folks. So we're gonna put you in different breakout rooms. Love the chat, keep that going. Um, gonna put you in breakout rooms. If this is something that you're not feeling this morning, no worries. You can just stay in the main room with me, enjoy the jazz. Um, but I hope you get to meet other Twiggies and talk about all the different things that you have going on right now. We wanna know what you got going on. So we are going to break it up in three, two, one.
Welcome, welcome, welcome back everyone. We are just wrapping up some breakout rooms. And when everyone gets back, it'll be time for Twig Trivia, which was provided this month by our fantastic guest speaker, Laura Zapata. Laura, I hope you'll help me out with the trivia a little bit. Maybe we ask the questions and you give the answers. But we're gonna we're gonna throw up the poll once we get everybody back from the breakout rooms. Perfect. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed meeting some new faces. Oh, I love seeing all these videos on. Makes me feel good that there are real people behind there. So we now have some twig trivia for you before we get started on early and you're amazing. So you are going to see a poll pop up on your screen. Let's see what you know about solar power. And like I mentioned earlier, this trivia was provided to us by our fabulous guest speaker, Laura Zapata. So you can go ahead and answer all the questions, hit submit. And then when we have a good bunch of the group that's voted, we will reveal the answers. Okay, see so some of the answers coming in. It's a pretty this looks like a pretty knowledgeable group. I feel like I feel like they would know everything on here. We should have thrown them a curveball. All right, let me give you one more minute. One more minute to answer Twig Trivia. All right, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you guys can see both me and Laura. If you go to view, do gallery view, you can also see all of the Twiggies in the room. Make some new friends, see some old friends. Need units for four. Oh, Diane, that's a very, very good question. So how much is a metric ton? That's all in pounds. So metric ton to pounds. I need you at seven in the morning. You need to come over to my house and we do this together. <laughs> All right, very good engineer. That's an engineer's brain. I was a international politics major. We didn't deal with that. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna give you five, four, three, two, one. All right, Laura, how much of the electricity in the US is solar? Is it 4%, 7%, 12% or 18%? So apparently this was the trick question because it's actually 1.7%. So it's 2%. Um, so we all got it wrong, but that's, that, that's what it is in the U.S. today. Well, whoever said 4%, I'm counting it. That was, that was the number that I had written down. So seven people giving you credit. 7% uh, was the most common answer. Drop that in the chat if you guys are surprised. All right. Laura, how much of the electricity in Tennessee is solar? 0.1%, 0.2%, 0.3%, 0.3%, 0.4%. This is 0.4%. Uh, uh, here in Tennessee, the Sun Belt state, um, we have 0.4% of our electricity comes from the sun. Nice. We had four people get that right, four smart people. Go ahead and brag in the chat about that. You deserve it. All right, what is the annual carbon footprint of the average American? Five metric tons, 16 metric tons, 25 metric tons, or 32 metric tons? 
So I'm very happy that you put um, the question about pounds in here because I had no real idea what a metric ton is, but that's how carbon is uh, accounted for. But it's 16 metric tons for the average American per capita. Um, that's, that's our average carbon footprint. 16. Ooh. And six people got that right. Go six people. All right. This one, I feel like I should, I should ask Diane for the answer. I feel like she's just going to know it. How much is a metric ton in pounds? Is it 1,016 pounds? Is it 1,947 pounds? Is it 2,205 pounds? Or is it 2,864 pounds? So I, I, I'm glad that we're having a math class early in the morning on a Friday. It's 2,205 pounds is a metric ton. So multiply that times 16. That is our average carbon footprint per um, year per person in the U.S. Yes, go women in STEM. They were converting like a champ. 19 people knew that. We got, we got some engineers in the room. We got, we got some very smart people. Some quick Googlers, not going to blame you if you have to do that. <laughs> got to do what you got to do to win Twig Trivia. All right. And let's, how many Twig programs have you attended? Five people say this is your first one. Welcome. We are so glad you're here. Drop it in the chat. Let us know if this is your first one. Tell us who you are, where you're calling from. We want to reach out. We want to make sure you're having a great time. We want to say welcome. So um, board members, Twig board members, if you could please rename yourself. So it's your name, then it says board member, just so everybody knows I can reach out to you. It's a friendly face. I want to learn more. We have eight people here, two to three times. So glad you came back. Love that you had a good time and you wanted to come back to Twig. Uh, we've got eight people that said four to 10 times, pretty regular, love it. Three people, 11 to 20 times. Okay, they are committed, but the five people, 21 plus, oh my gosh. VIPs, love our veterans, love our newbies. So glad everyone is here. This is so exciting. Uh, as I mentioned, this month's speaker is gonna be Laura Zapata, Renee Barker, who is our board president. She's gonna tell you all about what we've got going on today, but you're going to hear her incredible story in sustainability. You are going to hear different announcements from Twig, things that we have going on, volunteer opportunities, book club, scholarship opportunities, and not just for tuition, like I mentioned earlier. It can be for workshops or conferences or all sorts of different programs. We love creative applications and proposals. We have tons of money. We want to give it away please apply for the Twig Seed Fund. It's all available at Tennessee Women in Green's website, which we will drop in the chat so you don't have to remember and we'll send you it via email, get our newsletter, and you just get to connect with us in so many different ways, which I think is really fabulous. Our mission is to connect women who are committed to sustainability and the men that love sustainability and love women and sustainability too. You are all part of Twig. We're so excited you're here. All right, I'm going to toss it over to Renee Barker, who is our board president, so she can get us started this morning. Renee, gonna make you co-host. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I love that there's lots of first timers. That's really wonderful. We we love having first timers and. Um, if we have some time after announcement, we'd love to hear from you and, and just see how we can help you in your sustainability journey. If there's someone you want to connect with, let us know. Um, if you want to chat on a coffee Zoom, we can do that too. Just uh, message a board member and we, we love doing that. Um, so it is 8 a.m. We are going to get started here. And first off, we have a short infomercial from one of our sponsors. Um, and if you are interested in becoming a sponsor, I'm just gonna drop the link in the chat really quick. Um, and yes, yeah, so we have Dodd Galbraith from the Lipscomb Institute of Sustainable Practice, uh, the founder of this, uh, the first academic sustainability program in the Southeast, which is really awesome. And uh, we, I know we have lots of alum in this group too from the program. Uh, so Dodd, uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much. So I assume I can share my screen. Is that okay at this moment? Yeah. 
All right. Yes. So let me, let me do that. Okay. All right. Good morning. I, I, oh, I guess I need to uh, hang on a second. Let me, let me assume you can see the, uh, I'm going to minimize the, uh, the view so you won't see everybody's faces. There we go. So I really don't feel like a sponsor. We're really here just to support this amazing organization. But um, I imagine many of you are thinking about, should I be a graduate student or should I not? And so what I thought I'd do is just share a little bit about that thought process and some examples of people who have done that uh, recently and, and in the past. But uh, graduate school, uh, all graduate degrees offer varying um, uh, value propositions. But uh, a, a Master of Science in Sustainability at Lipscomb uh, offers these three specific value propositions. That is, it's very convenient. Uh, before the pandemic started three years ago, we created what's called a high flex program. So you can take a class online, you can watch it on Zoom, you can attend on campus, and you can watch recordings when you don't have time to do either on any given class, on any given day. You don't have to be a full-time online student, a full-time on-campus student, or even a full-time asynchronous student. You just do what's convenient for you on the night of that class. The other amazing thing about graduate degrees is they routinely increase salary potential. So people make more money with graduate degrees because employers like people who can think critically, who have that indicator uh, that they are an advanced thinker, and, and they have a deeper insight into their discipline and then their undergraduate degree uh, and they'll pay you more to do it. So that's very routine. Uh, but the most important aspect of graduate school is to move from a, a, a content specialist to an expert and from an expert to an influencer. And one of the things that we really do a really good job of is helping people no matter where they are uh, is to get from whatever, whatever point in life they're in to the next point of life. And I want to share some quick stories with you about these three individuals. Uh, Belinda Morrow came to us a couple of years ago with a almost a 30 year career in green building. And I'm not going to tell you her age, but uh, cause she, she that's, that's not my role to do, but she, uh, she came to us to get a master's degree late in her career because she wanted to add extra value to her green building consulting business in Atlanta. And she's done that completely online and is uh, coming to Nashville today for me to give her and her family a tour around town because she's graduating tomorrow, which is really exciting. Um, the second gentleman I mentioned was Donta Bush. He came to us with a master's degree, an MBA from another university, and he decided to combine his master of science in sustainability with that background. And before he could graduate, Deloitte hired him and moved him to Phoenix. And so he, uh, he came back and uh, finished his degree online with us. And he's got a, a wonderful career in Phoenix now managing supply chain issues. Uh, this next student uh, was working at Nissan and Nissan really wouldn't let him, wouldn't let Jerry Faber uh, work on electric cars. And, uh, and so he came back and got a master's degree from us. He was an industrial engineer already. He went to work with Tesla and he actually helped to design the Model 3 assembly line, but then was hired by Rivian. I don't know if you know about Rivian, they just won the contract to sell 100,000 electric delivery trucks to Amazon uh, and they're designing a new SUV and a new truck that's all electric. So this is an example of where most of our students go. Some of you who are on the screen here today work at some of these firms. Uh, this is just a small sample of the different companies our, our students work at. But uh, one of the other exciting things we do is we don't just learn in Tennessee. We go to New England. Uh, we study uh, organic farming. This is uh, the picture on the right is from a skyscraper in downtown Boston that uh, Boston property owns. They own the John Hancock building and the Prudential building. This is their uh, uh, vice president of sustainability giving us a tour of the solar panels on the roof of the building. But you can learn all about our amazing alumni through a new podcast series we've started called Sustain It Forward, where we're helping our alumni pay it forward or sustain it forward in terms of sharing the lessons they've learned with other professionals. And uh, we have a new webinar coming up on June 7th and I'm going to post those links right now. And uh, I also want to introduce Frank Osteen, our uh, recruitment manager. And I'm going to ask Frank to post his contact information for you as well. And I think that that's all I've got, folks.
Amazing. Thank you, Dad. And if, if anyone has questions, um, just drop them in the chat as well. And, and we'll, uh, we can forward those questions later, or uh, if we have time at the end of the presentation, um, we can jump back into the questions. We'll keep an eye on the chat. All right, so we are moving on to our main program presenter, Laura Zapata. Uh, Laura Zapata is a co-founder of Clear Loop Corporation, a Nashville-based startup that helps companies reclaim their carbon footprint and expand access to clean energy in the United States by building solar projects that clean up the grid. Laura immigrated from Columbia with her family and grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. She graduated from Dartmouth College. I think we saw some alums also in the chat from Dartmouth, which is awesome, uh, is, and is now working to help companies of all sizes take tangible climate action and ensure that the environmental, health, and economic benefits of new solar projects reach American communities otherwise getting left behind. All right, Laura, take us away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here. And it's so nice to see some familiar faces um, in, in here and some new people. Um, I feel like uh, Dartmouth people are everywhere, uh, even in Tennessee. And it's always nice to see that. So thank you all so much for having me. Um, so I, I, I'm going to do a little presentation. It's going to be dynamic. We'll see if it works. And if it doesn't work, we'll just roll with it. Um, but uh, I'm Laura Zapata. I uh, have been the co-founder of a startup, uh, Clear Loop, for about two years. But prior to that, my life had nothing to do really with sustainability. I was really interested in politics, and that was where I started my career. I started um, going, I, I went to school and uh, left Tennessee and went to study uh, political science because that's what I was really passionate about. I was very passionate about the immigration system. And so I worked on the Hill for a long time and my passion led me to communications. So I did political communications for the primary part of my career and I really stuck to it. So I was on the Senate side and the House side did that. Um, but after a little bit of time in my early 20s, I realized that uh, being on the Hill is sort of, you are either a lifer or you move on to do something else in, in your career. And so I decided to move on and do something else um, because dusting off some talking points for, for Congress people to talk it was interesting, but it was, I, I needed to do something else. So I moved across the country and I worked for Uber. Um, so I um, worked for the Uber San Francisco office back in 2014 when they were looking for more communications people to try to tell the story of, of Uber and how to, uh, what it was and how it worked. Um, because uh, if, even if we say today, you know, getting in the back of a car with a stranger was, um, you know, not as kosher in 2014. And so we're trying to tell the story of Uber in all of these different places across the West Coast and convincing um, different uh, cities that indeed it was a good it was a good thing for them to be able to have a, a ride at the push of a button. Um, but then politics came calling again, and so I moved to Ohio to work for the Hillary campaign. I was the pre the press secretary for that campaign there, um, which was very interesting. I had never lived in the Midwest, and uh, obviously it was a tough race, but it was a, a very interesting place to be and continue to be in communications. Um, in very um, sort of crisis-filled environments. And then I went back to Uber after 2016 to head up Uber Eats. And Uber Eats was not a thing uh, uh, back then either. And why was this company now bringing us food um, was sort of uh, the question back then. And it was also a time where Uber was in the news a lot. Um, so lots of crisis communications were happening during that time. And at the same time, I always had this itch to come back home to Tennessee. Tennessee is home. This is where I grew up. Um, I grew up in Memphis, um, so proud, proud Memphian. Um, and at the in, in 2018, there were some, or 2017, there were some rumors in the political circles that former Governor Phil Bredesen was running for Senate. Um, so I knocked on a lot of doors and found my way back home in Tennessee and became his uh, his communications director here in Tennessee for that Senate race. And so many of you may remember there was a, it was all over your TVs for a whole year of very intense campaigning. And although it was not successful, we did get Taylor Swift's endorsement, which was very exciting uh, for, for a millennial uh, to get that sort of endorsement, which is great. Um, and then 
what led me here and sort of where this journey takes up uh, the sustainability vein is really all around um, my community. I really wanted to come back home, wanted to figure out how, to, how do I make uh, a home of Tennessee again. And so the governor had approached me and the former campaign manager, Bob Horning, who's now my co-founder, I clear loop and said, you know, I have this idea and if you guys want to tr try it out, um, I'm happy to, to figure out how to um, support you all for six months. And the idea back then was called Carbon Zero. This was at the beginning of 2019. And the idea was companies, um, all kinds of airlines, Delta, for example, is offering people how to offset your carbon footprint when you fly, but it's very unclear how you actually offset that carbon footprint, where that money is going, and is it really doing what it said it's going to be doing. This seems to be something that will be growing over the next couple of years. People care about sustainability, climate change is happening and is real, and so what do we do about it, and how do we get those investments to come back home um, to this part of the country. And so that was the part that really got me excited. It was how do we bring this back to this, um, to Tennessee. If government wasn't going to do it, how did we get private sector to invest um, in, in helping our community here? And so that's where my journey with Clearloop started and with sustainability. I really saw this as a way to um, invest back here. And uh, the best way to do that was cleaning up the grid. Our electricity grid, as you all saw, uh, is incredibly dirty, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's the second um, top polluter for our carbon footprint in the United States. First is transportation. Second is uh, our electricity grid. We're still burning fossil fuels to make electricity today. And so we have the technology to um, help clean up the grid. And so how could we bring more investment to go on and build um, the capacity that we need to, to support uh, a cleaner grid so that every time we turn on our lights, we're not continuing to uh, make the crisis worse. Um, so that was, that was the genesis of Clear Loop. That was what led me to sustainability. That's where we are. Um, that's where I've been for the past two and a half years and that's what we built. So I would love to take you all down the, the journey of what we learned at Clear Loop, what we do. Essentially, we are working with lots and lots of different types of companies to help us offset their carbon footprint. And the way that they offset it is instead of buying a tree, they're essentially helping us build a new solar panel um, that goes into a bigger solar farm that replaces the fossil fuel generating um, units that we have across um, the country. Our first project is in Jackson, Tennessee. We're very proud to be building our first solar project um, in breaking ground later this summer. We just announced as part of Earth Day that we have a few different companies from Fortune 500 into it. Um, to very small startups um, like Drops and some other direct-to-consumer um, brands that are helping us build this particular solar project. So all of these brands are getting together and seeing that they have an impact on the environment. They want to help us clean up the grid. And so they're helping us um, invest um, in building this new solar project. So I'll walk through a little bit about what is the problem, how can we fix it, and then the opportunity that we see. Um, and then how Tennessee and, and sort of the middle part of the country is a really great um, area and community for us to be able to invest in um, and how investing in climate action leads to many other um, sort of economic um, and social good um, for, for our communities. So let me share my screen. All right, y'all can see that. Yep, okay, yes. great. Okay, cool. I was trying to see if anybody was nodding. All righty. So here we have a map of the US, uh, fairly straightforward. Um, so like I just said, you know, we have the technology to expand clean energy across our, uh, the United States. And despite that, we have an incredibly dirty grid and it's very uh, uneven. So um, one of the stats that is, is sometimes is a little eye-opening for people is that the grid um, is responsible for more of a carbon footprint than every plane and every car on the road today. Um, because when you take in the transportation sector and the carbon footprint there, you're counting boats and trains and all, this, uh, all these other things. But 
um, in as we, um, somebody mentioned Rivian earlier, in as we electrify more of our vehicles and our fleet, we're going to be plugging into this grid. Um, and so we're going to be putting more pressure on it. So here's the sort of challenge we have in front of us. Um, the, this map shows the marginal emissions, which means this is every time we turn on the lights, there is a carbon footprint associated with every megawatt hour of electricity that we use. For context, every household in the US uses about 10 megawatt hours every year. Um, so one megawatt hour of electricity leads to um, a few uh, different carbon footprints across the, the, the country. And this is what it looks like when you take it on average. Um, and the differences of why it looks different, why the carbon footprint of flipping on the lights and doing the same activity in different places around the country looks different is because obviously our mix and what we've invested in, the sources of, of electricity are different throughout the country. Um, and so here's a good way to sort of um, emphasize how different they are. In California, for example, this is what the New York Times does this every year. They show, you know, where does our electricity come from? And we see that in California, while a great deal of it is still coming from natural gas, which is a fossil fuel, there is an increasing number of other renewable energy resources that are creating electricity, including solar at 20% um, of their electricity. And if you were here at the very beginning for the trivia, you know that that um, is very different uh, in, in the state of Tennessee, which we'll see here. Um, in Tennessee, we generate electricity this way, although coal has been um, on the downward spiral, we've had more nuclear natural uh, gas growing, but at the same time, we don't see the sort of um, renewable energy like uh, solar and wind growing at the speed that we see it in other places. Um, and then at the same time, we see places like Minnesota, where coal continues to be incredibly um, um, heavy, um, as well as nuclear, and, and, but they also have invested in wind energy quite a bit. So you see the breakdown depending on where we are across the country. Um, and so what is interesting here, the opportunity that we see at Clearloop is that while those things are true, there's also the opportunity of looking at, at solar as a resource. And this is what the solar potential across the United States looks like today. This is from um, NREL, the National uh, Renewable Energy Lab. They look at the United States and this is how much solar availability there is throughout the, the country. And as you see here, um, the, the country um, throughout wherever you are, of course, the, the Southwest um, has a lot more solar potential, but wherever you are, um, there's sunny skies. And um, so we have an opportunity to really, to really um, uh, seize this opportunity. So despite the widespread opportunity, obviously more st some states have capitalized on, on investing in solar more than others. It's a widely sp spread resource, but the actual um, capacity that we've built across the United States has not been even. So we've seen places like California and even North Carolina that have made um, real efforts, um, whether it's policy or um, other efforts that um, have led them to actually increase the number of solar projects that they have throughout the states. And unfortunately, you see this, um, this sort of dark middle part of the country that has not invested um, even in the, in the sun belt of the country. So we are looking to change that. And what we are trying to do is essentially try to combine two things, the grid dirtiness, um, as well as solar availability. So where are the places in the country where you have the dirtiest grid, you can get the most solar sort of bang for your buck as you invest in more capacity in these places. So this is a map um, that we built to overlay those two different factors where you're looking at, here's the potential for the sun, as well as here's how dirty um, this electricity um, is that's being created today. And so by combining those two things, we are looking at the places that where it takes fewer watts to get just as much carbon out of the, out of the grid um, and to clean it up. And so you start seeing where the opportunities are in those places um, happen to be all over the country. 
So what we're aiming to do is by really focusing corporate investments in renewable energy in the part of the country where it is disproportionately carbon intensive. So the sturdy grids that I keep um, referring to, we'll see more, um, more focused efforts in cleaning up the grids. And, and that's what we all aim to do. Um, and then we started looking at other factors. We overlaid uh, things like socioeconomic factors like distressed communities. And we started mapping that out. And we saw that the same places where we're looking for, where there's opportunity to clean up the grid, where there's lots of sun, dirty grid, you can build um, just as much um, solar to get more carbon out, um, are also the places where there's distressed communities where there hasn't been a lot of investment and poverty is high. Um, so this middle part of the country, as you see, you know, the Mississippi Delta and other places um, around our home state, um, happen to be those same places. Um, and so this, this is just showcasing the, the different um, poverty lines of percentage of population. And you start seeing where there's also opportunity to invest into climate action as, a, as an economic development tool. And so this is what we're aiming to do. We're, we're making sure that we are trying, we're trying to be really intentional about not just the environmental aspect of this. And like I told you, my background is really all about community investment and how do we make sure that when we're building new infrastructure in these places that it, it's leading to um, economic development. So one of the places that I referenced earlier is Jackson, Tennessee. This is where our first project is uh, being built this year. It's a one megawatt project. One megawatt is a million watts, which if you think about watts, um, I always try to relay it back and, uh, and simplify it as, as much as possible. If you think about the number of watts that you buy in a light bulb, essentially we're uh, doing a million of those watts in, in Jackson, Tennessee. And that is enough to power about 200 homes. So this is uh, home to our first solar site. It happens to be, um, I, won't, I won't make you click on, the, on, on my video. Um, you have me here live, but we're right across the street from the Technical College in, in Jackson, Tennessee. So we're really excited about being able to partner with those guys because they, uh, to, to start building some workforce development um, programs so that their electricians can be trained. Um, right across the street at our solar project. And even though in utility scale measurements is fairly small, it really helps us build the case for how we can bring the, the, the investment, the carbon offset investment from all these different types of companies to um, focus on this one asset that is not just expanding access to clean energy and helping companies offset their carbon footprint. It's also serving as a community sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of core place for community and, and community center for, for folks to really learn that there is this new um, clean energy industry that's growing and will be growing here in our, um, in our neck of the woods. So, our call to action is really we want to clean up the grid. Um, we believe fundamentally that all the benefits of building new solar projects are across the United States, the things that have been that, that North Carolina and California and New York have seen uh, can be true here in this middle part of the country. We are um, the real sort of underlying innovation behind Clearloop is the way that we are building these solar projects is looking um, at carbon as sort of the primary driver for us to build these, these um, projects. But then the other part of this is bringing along all these companies that say they wanna take a climate action and being really directional and intentional about where they're investing their money so that it, it results in a brand new solar project at the end of the day. Um, this is very different from the way that solar has been created in the past and has been constructed um, in the past, meaning the past 10 years. Uh, solar is a fairly new industry, so it's only been around for the past 10 years. Um, and, and the folks who have really led that have been big tech companies that wanted to make sure that their um, data centers were green. And so now we have the opportunity to break open this market and try to get more companies that are looking to offset their carbon footprint, are doing everything they can to reduce their carbon footprint. There is a remaining carbon footprint when they create shoes or whatever it is that they sell um, and trying to get their money to be invested into 
bringing these brand new solar projects to communities that would otherwise not see this kind of investment. So we are excited about the future, um, have already seen lots of um, great um, feedback from all kinds of companies that we did not um, uh, think that they were going to uh, be part of this that had never heard of Jackson, Tennessee before, but want to be part of, of this uh, project. And so we are hopeful about the future. We have a few other projects that we have uh, scoped out for this part of the country, which that's the that's the whole um, genesis for me wanting to be part of this and bring sustainability is in, in bringing a different perspective, um, making it really, really easy for people to understand what it is that they're doing with their actions or bringing that communications background to it. So I uh, appreciate the time. I know that we had some, times, uh, some time for questions and would love to get them from y'all. Yes, thank you, Laura. We have some great questions and keep them coming, drop them in the chat. We will ask those. So first one is how many large solar projects are underway in Tennessee? There's lots. So Tennessee, it's, it, it's growing. It's a growing um, industry. Um, our friends and our sort of partners at Silicon Ranch, uh, they've been around for a lot longer than us. They've been around for 10 years. Um, they were also co-founded by Governor Bredesen. They um, have large scale facilities, 100, 200 megawatt projects that are popping up um, throughout the Southeast and, and across the country. Um, but the way that we're financing these new solar projects at Clearloop is very different from the way that, that they and every other developer does it. So we're hoping to supercharge the number of solar projects that we have um, across Tennessee and, and the country. Very Cool. So I'm familiar with Silicon Valley, but what is Silicon Ranch? So Silicon Ranch is another, it's a company called, it's an independent power producer. Um, that's what most of the uh, different solar and wind developers are called. Silicon Ranch is, um, it's also a national based company. They um, were uh, started by three Tennesseans, one of them, Governor Bredesen, and two other folks who came from his administration. And they um, they fund so they they build and operate um, solar projects that are financed by the sort of the way that it's been done for the past ten years. It's a power purchase agreement. You guys are all going to get really in the weeds of this, but a power purchase agreement is the way that you finance most solar projects in the United States today. So basically, Facebook says to a developer, "Hey, I want to have green energy in my data center." Um, they have the ability to do that because they have the credit worthiness and they have the ability to say, yes, for the next 10, 20, 30 years, I'm going to buy solar power from you at this rate from this facility. And so they go, the, the developer goes to the bank and says, I have Facebook on the line. They want to buy the solar project from me. They're, gonna, they, they're good for the money for the next 30 years. And the bank says, awesome, that's great. Go build the solar project. That's how the majority of solar projects and wind projects are built in the United States today. Now, what we're doing is very different because what we're saying and very similar to how you buy a house, um, we're saying we don't have somebody at the end of the line who's going to buy the power for the next 30 years. What we have is money down. Um, we are bringing all these companies into it, drops, a few others, cool perks, a few other companies that are helping us build this solar project in Jackson, Tennessee. What they're doing is they're giving us a fee to offset their carbon footprint. We then take that fee and it's a percentage of what the project costs. We go to the bank and say, hey, we have this money down um, and we would like to go build the project. We don't have, um, and so just like you buy a house, we, uh, we, we have this uh, sort of model to finance these new solar projects with that way. And, and then the companies, what they get at the end of the day, it's not the power. What they get is the carbon offset value. The fact that when you build a new solar project, you're avoiding um, carbon from being um, created. And so that's what they are looking for. They're less interested in the actual power and the power goes back to the community, to the utility, wherever we are operating the solar facility. So it allows the community to take advantage of the clean power um, and for the company to say, you know, we've done, we've done some good here because we've helped to build this new solar project um, in a way that they weren't, they either weren't able to or, or um, didn't have the ability to um, if they didn't sign a power purchase agreement or couldn't. Gotcha. Perfect, love that, thank you. 
Next question we have coming up for you. Um, does the president's proposed infrastructure plan include significant resources for solar investment? Yes, so the president has done a good job of uh, focusing folks' energy and attention on the grid. Um, the grid is our biggest opportunity to decarbonize our economy. Um, and so he's really emphasized that. Now, when it comes to the actual, you know, what does that look like and, and how is it going to work? Um, it's still a question mark. They've, they've extended and they've proposed extending some of the solar credits um, that help finance some of these projects, which is helpful. Um, but the more we can emphasize that the grid is really our opportunity, that's two years ago and still today, um, a lot of the carbon offset pro programs that are out there are very, um, are, are emphasizing natural solutions. So they're talking about trees and, and other things. We've really, switch that around and try to focus on the grid um, as our, um, our biggest opportunity. And we're getting a lot of questions in here about uh, with, um, you know, clearly really focusing on, you know, large scale working with businesses, things like that. Um, do you see there's a, is there a similar business case for residential solar? or just in general, what kind of opportunities are out there for individuals to offset their carbon? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we have focused on utility scale because we really want, we want to scale the, um, how do we accelerate the carbonization? We just, you know, every time you turn on the lights, that's, that's what we want it to be plugged into is the solar projects. Um, so that's where we have focused and we're only two years old and one of those years was during a pandemic. So um, th this has been our, our focus so far. What we started experimenting with recently as part of our sort of Earth Day promotion was selling directly to individuals. And so you too can put your name on a solar panel or you too can offset your carbon footprint by um, buying um, a few watts of capacity. And so on our website, uh, if you're interested in taking a look, there's a little dynamic calculator where you can put, um, you know, how many solar panels or how much money do you want to invest in something like this? Um, because we wanted to test out whether or not individuals would be interested in something like this. And um, Sierra Magazine just did a little blurb about um, one of the best Mother Day presents uh, for Mother Earth and your mom could be um, you know, doing this with Clear Loop. So uh, I don't know what that looks like, what the future of that looks like, but um, it's, it's an interesting way to kind of get individuals to have a direct impact on, on what we're doing and, and help us fund these things directly. I love including Mother Earth and Mother's Day. We have somebody looking for specific recommendations on where they can get small solar wind turbines to include on their property. So we got some folks with land out here. And if you got any ideas, I'm sure they would love your recommendations there. Uh, so next question yeah, is, that's a, that's are a good, you, so... no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you have land um, that you want to sell, um, the folks in Silicon Range are always looking for land. So if you are interested in selling your land in Tennessee or wherever it is uh, and want a solar project, I'm sure um, th those folks would appreciate um, the, the tip. All right, next question is, are you familiar with the solar park that NES Nashville Electric Services is developing? Um, uh, no, um, maybe, I don't know which one this one is. Um, there was a community solar project that they've done, uh, I believe. Um, so right now TVA has a program that's called the, the Local Power Company Flexibility Program. And what they're allowing to do is allowing every local power company, including NES, to do 5% of their load as um, and, and go out and purchase it on their own and make it renewable. And so all of these com all of these um, local power companies are going out. This is the first time that they can buy from outside of TVA. So it's also sort of an economic incentive if they can buy power for cheaper um, from somebody else, um, then they can do that. And in solar is a cheaper resource um, in, in many parts of the country, including here in Tennessee. 
And so they have the opportunity to go out. Um, so if you're interested in uh, you know, asking NES what they're doing with their flexibility program, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good start. Sounds like we have a potential speaker for another monthly program right there. Learn more about what they're doing I'm... here. All right. Um, you had mentioned, we can hear you, but yeah, you are frozen. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hopefully we will get your video back. Um, but you had talked about renewable energy credits and certificates. Who owns those? Yeah. So can you guys hear me right now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, and you're back. Okay. Okay. So the um, the so in order to create the carbon offset credit from this new solar projects, you need to either count it as, as either a renewable energy certificate, a REC, or you count it as a carbon offset in order to get the environmental attribute from um, this new solar project, you can either count, you, you can only count it once. And so lots of companies are looking for a way to quantify their carbon. And you can do that by saying, okay, by building um, 37 watts of new solar in Jackson, Tennessee, that will be by, by turning on those watts for the next 40 years, you will be offsetting, um, you will be avoiding one metric ton of carbon from being um, emitted into the atmosphere. That's sort of the equivalency that we have. So that is the, so one metric ton of carbon is offset by building 37 new watts of solar in Jackson. Um, that's how companies are taking credit for it. Now, if companies are interested in taking the renewable energy um, certificates instead, um, one megawatt hour of electricity in, from a green program, from a green power plant, um, from solar wind, equates to one rec. Um, the reason we um, sort of have gone down the carbon route is because more companies are looking for, for ways to offset their carbon footprint as opposed to make their um, green energy green. And because a rec, um, we, we really are focused on the, on the carbon value because one megawatt hour of electricity being created from a solar plant in uh, California or in New York does not have the same carbon impact as one megawatt hour of electricity being created here or in West Virginia. And so we really want to emphasize because the grid is not equally dirty. We want to emphasize that what we really care about is cleaning up the grid by really attacking the carbon problem and not so much because um, you can get a really cheap wreck from a uh, a hydro plant that's already operating in Vermont um, instead of buying, uh, instead of paying for something that's brand new and, and helping to build something brand new. And I know that that's probably for the people that are not in the rec space, that may be a little um, lofty, but essentially what we're doing is if you take the carbon credit from the solar project, the megawatt hours of electricity that are being generated by the solar project are accounted as brown power. So we're selling it back into the grid. So a rec is never created. Um, it's just a carbon offset. And, and if people have more questions and that le leads to more questions and confusion, feel free to send me a note. Hello at clearloop.us. I'm happy to talk about it all day. Yes, this is fascinating. We'll drop that in the chat as well. So hello at clearloop.us. So um, we're seeing lots of comments about love seeing a woman in the seat of power. Are you seeing a lot of other women entering the field of solar? Um, yes, I, so th this was not my, um, you know, if you had asked me when I graduated from college, if I was going to be doing this, I would have been very confused. I thought, you know, politics was going to be it. Um, so I think what I'm seeing is that there's a real need for more and more creative people to come into sustainability. And because it hasn't been figured out, we have a really big problem. We have a big communications problem as well about how do you make something that's science and heavy and a crisis and really break it down into its pieces and show people that 
there's opportunity to really dig in and you know just bring your experiences and expertise um, to this field. So I think um, I'm seeing I'm seeing more desire from women, especially young women, um, to to break into this field. And if I can be um, any example, you know, you don't have to have a science background. There's lots of scientists out there who are very willing and researchers and very smart people who are willing to um, share their data, their information, their um, their research with you. Um, and, and that's how we've learned. It's been knocking on a lot of doors, learning from a lot of experts, really getting their insights and trying to get, um, and then trying to build something from that, from our experiences, from, you know, how do we communicate this? How do we make this interesting and fun um, and much more engaging than just, you know, heavy darkness. So if you look at Clearloop's website is very intentional, the way we've built um, our website, our brand, we really wanna make this um, as easy and digestible to communicate because as you heard from me there's lots of things under sort of underlying uh, what we're building but just the action of helping to help companies reclaim their carbon footprint and expand access to clean energy is really the bottom line and what we're hoping that people can rally behind and building off of that thought what are some of your your biggest challenges or maybe lessons learned from your time leading the company um, I think the biggest challenge is, is trying to explain to folks exactly what it is that we're trying to do, um, because if, if some of the comments here have made it very clear, you know, the renewable energy world and the carbon world have been very separate for a long time. And so when people are talking about carbon offsets or their carbon footprint, they're very focused on how do I buy a tree or get a methane program or lower my carbon footprint by, you know, just doing better things. Um, and then the renewable energy world has been sort of in the energy markets um, side of things and is much more complicated. It's very, um, it's been built around financial models that are very sophisticated. And so those two things don't really talk to each other. And so for companies that were looking to do green energy that couldn't sign a power purchase agreement, it was this sort of wreck market that never allowed them to build something new it was sort of like, there's a wreck that's coming from a solar project somewhere and it's not directing it to build something. And so bringing those two concepts together that you could actually build a brand new solar project by paying for a carbon offset um, has been sort of mind blowing to a lot of people. Um, and then um, the, the other challenges we have, you know, we are brand new, nobody knows who we are. Um, we are coming from the middle of Tennessee. It's not, you know, we're not in Silicon Valley. Um, so all of those things have been sort of challenges that we've really embraced. Um, but I think that having that perspective and, and we really embrace them as opportunities because, you know, it's one thing to be coming from California and to be saying, yes, we need to build more solar projects and here's my cool tech idea. It's another thing to say, you know, we're from this community and we need the investment here and it may be happening in other parts of the country and it, you know, it may not need the incentives of a carbon offset um, to build new solar projects in Arizona, but we really need it here in West Virginia and in Tennessee and in Kentucky. And so um, that, you know, sort of, sort of emphasizing the community aspect, the expanding access to clean energy and making it a more equitable way to invest in, in clean energy has really been a powerful tool for us. That, so it's a challenge that turned into an asset at the end of the day. That is incredible. Well, and um, seeing some amazing stuff in here about uh, women getting their education in green. Um, John said 11 of our 14 new students were women in the ISP program. We even have an alum in here that went to renewable energy after graduating from Lipscomb's program. Uh, and thinking through just the next wave of women that are coming out of undergrad or, or graduate school or anything like that, what's your advice for how we can encourage them, how we can attract them, um, and how we can really get more Tennessee women in green? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm not going to, I'm trying not to embarrass her, but Brooke, who is on here, she it was one of our first interns who has just graduated from Vanderbilt. Um, and she's, um, you know, 
I think that folks who are just curious about the world, and I think that having more women and uh, young people who are curious about the world and encouraging that curiosity is always a really, um, a really great thing. And, and I think that being able to sort of pop in here and have the ability to show the breadth of sustainability and sustainability roles um, that are out there and the ones that haven't been created. I mean, we just came up with this two years ago. So there's lots and lots of things that, um, lots of opportunities for us to continue to grow um and and to really make that um curiosity something that is encouraged especially um you know i think ambitious young women um usually in college feel like they have to have a path um at least that was my uh, experience and so you know being able to try different things on and having twig be a platform that can encourage that curiosity i think um those women will be well served. And I think Twig as an organization will be well served. So, um, you know, I, I encourage if, if folks have questions or um, want to network, this is, I think this is a great forum to do it. And I would love to say hello. And um, I've met a lot of women on here, thanks to just LinkedIn and reaching out and just asking questions and being curious about what um, what other people are doing. Well, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, if anybody wants to come off mute, do some clapping, we would love to just thank you so much for everything Yay. that you gave to us today. Awesome. Yeah, Laura, we learned so much and we really, really appreciate you. Everything that you're doing for Tennessee and for sharing your time this morning. Thank you, Laura. All right. Thank you all so, so much. Next up, I'm going to toss Laura. it over to Gracelyn Jones. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So Gracelyn Thanks so much, Jones Laura. That was amazing. Is going to just articulate. Hey, can everybody hear me? I think my, my internet might be a little spotty. It's just one of those days, but... Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. Yes, we can Laura, hear you. That... If something would... huh. Well, I'm just going to keep rolling through it. And if y'all can't hear me at any point, just let me know. Um, but Laura, that was amazing. Clear Loop is such a smart company. Your messaging is so creative and impressive. And we need y'all here really bad. So thank you for all you do. You're such an amazing role model. And thank you for being our speaker today. It was great. And good morning. Welcome to Twig. Um, it's great to have you all here. It's I cannot believe it's May. It's crazy. It's just flying by, but um, we're so glad to have you all here and to start off start off our month this way. Our mission, as always, is to empower, inspire, and connect women who are committed to environmental sustainability. So thank you all for helping us do that this year. I know I say this every single time, but we could not do what we do without our sponsors. I just, I'm going to keep repeating it because we are just so grateful for each and every one of you. Um, Y'all allow us to achieve our mission. So thank you so much if you are a sponsor. If you, if you or your workplace is interested in becoming a sponsor, we do have more information on our website at TennesseeWomenInGreen.com forward sponsors under Get Involved on the homepage. Thank you if you started or renewed your membership with TWIG. Um, if you are new to TWIG, feel free to reach out to anyone on the board. Um, I think on our little name tags, if we're on the board, we have board by our names, but um, you can send an email to our general email, tnwomenandgreen at gmail.com. Um, we would love to meet with you virtually, or I know a couple of us are you know, ready to do like a little socially distanced coffee if anybody's interested in that. So. We're, you know, easing back out there, but we would love to meet you all. So send us an email and we'd love to set something up. 
All right, upcoming events. We've got a lot of them and we have more of them on our website. So this isn't it. This is just a highlight reel. But tomorrow, um, the 8th, Warner Parks is doing another one of their pulling parties. Um, so you'd be pulling invasive plants to protect native species and combat the spread of invasive species. Um, and they're beautiful plot of land. And they also teach you a lot about, um, you know, how these plants threaten native ecosystems. And you'll learn a lot too while you like get your steps in and get your hands dirty. So it's a great event. Definitely encourage everybody to go if they haven't been yet. Um, it's tomorrow at 9 a.m. And Wednesday, the 12th at noon, Urban Green Lab is presenting a webinar on living buildings, which if you don't know, they go beyond energy and water efficiency and they actually create these environments that give back and improve physical and, and mental health even um, and support a just and equitable world. So can't get much better than that. It's a super interesting concept. So Urban Green Lab will be talking with a living building challenge expert in Nashville. Um, registration is on their website and we also have a link on our events calendar. And the next Iris's book club, um, the meeting is May 19th at 6 p.m. and they're currently reading Lab Girl. Um, so you don't have to have finished the book to go, just go talk about the book and just learn a little bit. Um, it's a great group. And then I'm super excited about this. Um, on Saturday the 22nd at 9 a.m., um, Twig is joining forces with the Boys and Girls Club of Middle Tennessee, and we will be building garden beds. So this is going to be an awesome event. It'll be 9 a.m. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the, well, yeah, I can drop a link in the chat after um, my announcements, but sign up to get more information about where we're meeting, things you can bring, um, but it'll be a great event. And of course, mark your calendars for our next program on June 4th, networking at 7.30 and program begins at eight. So we'll see you there. So our amazing and very talented, brilliant board member, Kristen Westerbeck added this feature on the um, members directory where you can add your hobbies and your current industry. So, I mean, like birding, fishing, paddle boarding, trail running, I mean, you name it, you can just add it in there. And if enough people do it, then you can search, you know, like hiking and a whole list of Twig members that are interested in that same thing will come up. And that's a super easy way to make connections and like, you know, get a little group together. So that's gonna be super valuable and just totally embodies the mission of Twig. So love that and make sure you go to your um, membership directory page to make sure you fill out that information. Thank you all. Um, if you supported us during the big payback, it was Wednesday and Thursday, so yesterday. Um, so if you donated your time or any fiscal donations, we really appreciate you. It's, it's a big day for us for sure. Um, so we're so grateful for the support that we received. Um, if you did miss this one, um, our next big fundraising event is Giving Tuesday in November. However, don't worry because we are always accepting donations on our website or the big button right when you log in. So feel free to um, donate your time or like any fiscal donations. I mean, we're, you know, we're always in need of help. So if you wanna donate your skills, we would be happy to connect you with the subcommittee to get you started. And we have t-shirts, super exciting. They look amazing. Um, they're made from 100% cotton from a local sustainable screen printing and design company called Friendly Arctic. Um, and 100% of the profits will go back to support Twig's mission and goals. Um, so please contact marketing at tennesseewomenandgreen.com to pre-order a shirt. Um, it'll be a porch pickup. So since we're not really doing in-person events right now, um, we usually just have them set out. But this time, if you order one, um, just let us know the size and color you like, and then I will give you the address and we can just do a little um, porch pickup there. So super exciting. And then I think this is the last thing, most important thing. Free coffee if you attended today's meeting, um, courtesy of the Green Interchange. So this is at Ugly Mugs in East Nashville and all you have to do is mention Twig. And lastly, thank you again for spending your morning with us. It's always so great to see you. It's like the perfect way to end the week and to start the month. So always go to our website. Um, any information will be there that we have available, job postings, events, anything we've got going on will be on our website 
Um, if you have any events or job postings you'd like us to share, um, please email us at tnwomenandgreen at gmail.com. We will get those posted and connect with us if you haven't already on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Other than that, y'all have a great rest of your month. Good to see everybody.